this episode's going to be a little different, perhaps a little heavier than usual. I want to talk about the power of reaching out, how simply being there for someone can make an unfathomable difference, right? We tend to think of, you know, a monumental impact requiring monumental action, and sometimes that's simply not the case. Sometimes it's just showing up and letting someone know that, hey, I'm in your corner. And I've been thinking a lot about this, right? This came to mind because over the past couple of weeks, I've had two people I went to high school with pass away, right? Young men in their mid-30s, gone. And by the way, they're two of many people from my high school that have either OD'd and died or taken their lives. It's an epidemic. And I'm sure it is across the board, right? But being that I am one and hear about it often, I know that particularly young men are feeling isolated. They're feeling lost. They're feeling depressed. The pandemic exacerbated this quite a bit. Right? It's a problem. And it's a, a complicated problem. Right? You can point to a lot of things. The way we connect now doesn't actually make us feel connected. We can't trick our brains into thinking that followers online are the same as friends grilling steaks with us in the backyard, right? It's different. But it's not only isolation, right? I think there's a crisis of meaning, of purpose, of feeling a part of something. There's a societal void. I don't think there's any question about that. You know, and in my little corner of the universe here, I talk frequently about the process of, of growing a business, of building a brand, you know, a lot of you are in the midst of the same thing. And so I delve into the highs and the lows, the ups, the downs. I have convos about it live. And I can tell you, right, nothing was as challenging as the loneliness of trudging through that, right? The middle. Not rejection, not failure, not being humbled by life, not being broke. No. It was the feeling of solitude, right? Almost haunting. Right? And, and you can make the argument part of that self-induced, right? It was, it was focused. Social life took a back seat. But regardless, it was very real. And what was worth gold were the, the texts from family saying, hey, I watched your video, great work. Or it was... My friend Zach, you know, out of the blue saying, hey, this will be worth it. You're onto something. Don't you dare stop. And call me on a Tuesday just to get me excited about my own company. Right? And like, when you're deep in the battle, that's not a little thing. That's not like a smile and an appreciate it thing. That's everything. That validated my reason to get up when things were difficult. One message. Right? And let's be real, right? My process was not catastrophic. You know, I had it pretty good. That was a pretty fortunate situation. My brain goes to imagine the people really fighting, right? Really going through something. Battling with their demons. And I'm reminded you know, as I watch all these people from previous chapters of my life decide the pain of being here is too much, that we can help. No, we're not magic. And no, there's no singular cure to a complex issue. But I'll tell you what, we all have the power by taking 30 seconds to shoot over a message that says, I love you, or I see how hard you're working, or keep pushing because your effort matters, to give someone hope. That stuff is life-changing. And not only that costs us nothing, but can mean everything on the other end. And some of the email responses I get from my newsletter just reminds me, it's like, you don't know what people are fighting through. You don't know what demons they're living with when you walk by them on the street, right? And if we can be the ones to be a bit more compassionate, 
the ones where hope and reassurance is derived and then distributed out to the world. Think about how incredible that is. How amazing it would be to simply be a part of that. And for those of you going through it now, thinking, yeah, you know, I would love to, I will spread that message, but my own glass feels empty right now. I'm having a hard time getting through in my own world. I want you to know two things. One, you're not alone. A lot of us are going through it with you in our own arenas, fighting our own battles. So don't think this is a burden placed solely on you. Life is hard. That's the challenge, but it's also the beauty. Which leads me to number two. There will be, I promise you, a point where you look back on the storm of right now and smile because you made it out. You're different now, better equipped now, stronger now. That's not a possibility, it's an inevitability. As Churchill is famously quoted saying, if you're going through hell, keep going. Because you're strong enough and what awaits will be worth every second of the journey. I wish we could see that in the middle, understand that in the thick of it, but we can't. That's not how it works. That's why we need to remind others, and it's why I'm reminding you. Life is a beautiful thing, but beauty can't exist without its inverse. We all endure chaos so that we can appreciate the calm. We all endure valleys of despair so that we can experience the rush of climbing out. It's a duality that's not always fun, but appreciating that is liberating. So keep going, keep trusting, keep pushing through. Hope is the greatest gift one can give. So give it to those around you and let it evolve into strength in your own world. It matters. More than you know, it matters. Remember what's yours to control and what's not, what must be let go. Remember that nothing is so futile as attempting to move the immovable or change the unchangeable. Remember that your greatest strength is focusing your time, talents, and efforts, exhausting your energy on that which you can control. And sometimes this distinction hurts. But to fail to see it is to shackle oneself to delusion. Right? You can complain about the weather all day, but to complain about it, to focus on it, to be stuck in it, is not going to change it. Your time would be better suited looking at how to adjust yourself to it. And that's what life repeatedly tells us. There's plenty we aren't happy about, plenty we wish we could change. But to stay there in that space is to forfeit your greatness, your strength. Why? Because there is so much you can control, so much you can do. You can always position yourself to succeed. But that calls for first separating what's yours and what's not. There are people I wish were different. There are situations I prayed were alterable. There are outcomes that are given without my asking. That's just life. And a losing mentality is to fight that, 
to feel anger or resentment at the people that let you down? Why couldn't they be how I want them to be? It's to dwell on the situation that occurred despite your wishes. Why couldn't it have just happened my way? It's to refuse to acknowledge the outcomes that have already materialized. Right? Why couldn't it just have evolved differently? All that, as hard as it is to see, is embracing a mentality of victimhood. It's walking down a path that has no desirable destination in store for you. When you accept the unchangeable, you then become the architect of your reality. Sure, people, places, and outcomes uh, weren't always the best, but now you ask, how can I navigate around it, or better yet, use it to my advantage? It is, to use the famous metaphor, not shaking your fist at the wind, but building sails for your boat creating a path to take you somewhere new. So let the energy, the time, and emotion that's wasted on the immovable dissolve. The question worth asking is where do you most want to be and how can you get there? And while those details outside the scope of your control can feel like a bottomless gap in your way, I promise that what's around you is enough to build a bridge over it. There's enough there for you to find your way, so long as we learn to separate the gap from the bridge, the details from the solutions, when all you see is why you can't go, or how it can't be solved, or how impossible something is. It's not that you are looking at an unfortunate truth, it's that you are looking at the wrong supporting evidence. When we stop seeing the details and outside circumstances as the deciders of fate, we win. When we place our eyes upon the controllable, when we step into what is ours to move and shape and transform, we finally see that the journey to something bigger is not only possible, it is inevitable. If there's time, then there's time to turn things around. If there is a tomorrow, then there is hope today. The only have to be's in life are the ones we prop up and adhere to. And how interesting that oftentimes we don't even realize we're the ones holding them up. There's a simple question that I like to ask as the sun comes up and the coffee brews. Am I living today like it's an obligation or something more? Is it an automatic continuation of the past or a methodical move towards a future that lights me up? And these aren't small distinctions. Right, I've lived both ways. I've felt what it's like to feel both. I remember going to work and joking around that a flat tire would be a real treat. That's not accountability. That's not control. That's essentially living life as a jellyfish floating along with the tide. And while the lack of required output Innovation and, and planning may have felt like a win in the moment or a burden lifted off my shoulders at the time deprived me of that which resides in the soul of every human being alive. Purpose. Personal agency. See, you can only go so far, so long being the spectator of your own journey. 
You can only go so long looking out the window before you wonder just what it'd be like to be behind the wheel. When we put our actions up against the question, why? It astounds me how many things are done because it's what we've always done. We act like we're expected to act, think like we're expected to think, see who we're expected to see, but expected by whom? Some of my greatest breakthroughs in life emerged after being asked why by people I look up to or respect. Why have you accepted that? That's your income? Okay, great, but why? That's how you spend your day? I see. How come? And when one is tasked with looking at their own life through a magnifying glass, some hidden truths always emerge. It shines a spotlight in the corner of the room, illuminating those shadows where one can, if they look hard enough, make out the wolf in sheep's clothing that is the phrase, because that's how I've always done it. We get in life what we accept. We are what we allow ourselves to be, and if we don't ask ourselves which mountain is worth climbing, which ocean is worth crossing, we simply float with the tides. We're at the mercy of the winds. We forfeit the mastery over our own lives that awaits if we're willing to take that wheel and navigate. So here are a few things to take with you. First is you are bound by nothing. The parameters you exist between are of your making. You can get in that car and drive. You can walk away and begin something new. You can entertain that vision that's been conveniently tucked away in the back of your mind. Understand that to not go is fine, but it's a decision. And perhaps a decision you'll wish you made differently. And second, difficult today liberates you tomorrow. It's easier to observe. It's easier to say how you wish things were. After all, stepping out into the fast-paced, chaotic world is tough. It's scary, it's unpredictable, but it's where you find yourself and the path that's calling your name. It's beyond the pins and needles emerging as one jumps into the cold water that they're able to find that evolution. If there's time, then there's time to turn things around. If there is a tomorrow, then there is hope. It was an ordinary run, on my ordinary loop, on an ordinary day, right in the middle of an ordinary week. I rounded the last corner that I'd encounter before finally returning back to the street that I lived on. Beautiful sunny afternoon, I remember the sun bouncing off my skin, the sweat dripping down my face. I was looking ahead, but not really at anything more so lost in my thoughts. Then out of nowhere, this little butterfly kind of swooped in, appeared right beside me. And it seemed, as it floated through the air, to link its pace with mine, effortlessly gliding. I looked over at it and back at the ground, Over at it again, back at the ground. And for a second, I wondered what it would be like to be one of those flying machines. The ones built for flight, navigating the sky with no restriction. What a feeling that must be. And as I looked over for a third time, it had slipped back 
into whatever types of things are important to a butterfly on a warm June day, but realized, as I carried forward, alone again, that for a few seconds we were side by side, it in the air and me on the ground. I hung in there with the flying machines. That's right, the creatures with wings designed specifically for flight. I was for a time amongst them. So what truly separated us? See, my whole life I have drawn lines. Lines that separate them from me. From can and cannot, from possible and impossible. There have been times where I saw reality as prepackaged. Basically as though you get what you get. Factory, stock, out of the box. It took a long time to see what I wanted. And instead of saying, hey, must be nice, or they have it made, to instead ask, how can I reverse engineer that outcome? What do I need to do now to get what is ultimately available? Because it's very available and it's very real. Just because you are not built like those flying machines doesn't mean you can't run alongside them. Join their ranks. Become one of them. The thing is, instead of drawing walls and building parameters, you have to give yourself permission to adapt and evolve. I was thinking about this the other day as one of my best friends was sharing some of the work he does uh, with his real estate portfolio. He was talking about some of the lessons learned on social media, and it was met with resentment, disdain. You have X, I don't. You make Y, I don't. You came from Z, I didn't. And I read the comments, I just shook my head and thought, they don't know. They don't know he grew up on a farm in Michigan, spending a long time working for less than minimum wage. They don't know that he put himself through college. They don't know that he took out a loan, having no clue what he was doing and learned how to renovate a home by himself. See, here's what he didn't do. He didn't point up and say, wow, look how free they are. Must be nice. No, he asked, how do I run alongside them? I am not an observer. I am a flying machine. Because the truth is, we can do so much, become so much, once we've uh, erased the mental lines that we've drawn over the years. Once we give ourselves permission to join that little segment of reality, we've deemed to be ideal, but have yet to walk towards. Nothing happens to the ordinary moments, the ordinary days or weeks or months, until you realize ordinary is just a label you've been placing on the pathway to extraordinary. Everything you need is there, except your past willingness to walk through it. And today is a new day. You will take to the sky in your own life when you stop drawing lines around everything you want and compartmentalizing it as not for you. And instead, run alongside the life you want as though it was already yours. Life is not a game of those who are and those who aren't. It's a game comprised of those who will and those who won't. Those who see how they can and those who see how they can't. You can wish, hope, and watch time fly by, or you can join the ranks of the flying machines that leave all that behind and take to the sky. Sometimes we have to hear no 99 times before we can get to our yes. 
sometimes we have to repeatedly fall before we can stand our ground. But here's the beauty in all that. It doesn't matter how many times you fall or how many no's you get. It only takes one yes for things to change, to turn around. You only need that one door to open for you. It's very easy to get caught up in the negative, the locked doors and the rejections, but they are not the problem. They're part of the process. They're what we have to go through to get to our destination. And one of the greatest things you can do for yourself and your goals is to depersonalize these locked doors. They're not the world working against you. They are the world working for you, bringing you one step closer to the path that you need to take. Don't stop at door one or two or 50. Stop when you've gotten the answer you're seeking. I wanna share a theme with you that continuously reemerges in my life. And every time it does, I'm grateful. I'm a little bolder, a little wiser, a little more grounded. The idea is simple. It's creating a low barrier to entry. Let me explain what I mean. The other day I was on a call with Ashley, who is uh, a brilliant member of the team here, and we're talking about social media. And as we're talking, I'm going on and on about the end state, how I think things should in a perfect world be uh, with you know, our platforms and the output. And uh, it's important to note for this particular project, we're kind of uh, on the ground floor, right? So in reality, I couldn't possibly know what the end state's going to be. There's a lot of epiphanies to be had. There's twists and turns that I couldn't possibly anticipate. I think it's great to have a North Star in a vision, obviously, but winning in the long run requires observation and reflection and adjustment and on and on. So uh, as I'm speaking, you know, she's listening, nodding her head, you know, agreeing with the vision. But after some thought says, well, why don't we just start with what we have now, right? Keep the barrier of entry low so that there's less friction and uh, we can start seeing how you know things evolve and i thought that was just incredible right it's what i temporarily lost in the moment for sure uh, you win by going and then evolving so many would-be amazing pursuits were never started because you know we make initiating them too complex same thing happened on another call that same day right i'm talking to uh Tyler, a business partner for another project coming around the corner. And, uh, you know, I'm sending him videos, talking about ideas for rollout, different avenues we could take, which again, it's great. It's better to have a large vision and trim it down than no vision at all, but the convo is the same. You know, Ed, I love it, it's great. But what if we start with one thing though, one idea, let's get the gears turning. That needed to be the theme for the day, and I appreciated it, right? So a few thoughts. One, surround yourself with sharp people like Ashley and Tyler that keep you grounded. But two, and perhaps the main point, stop creating friction for yourself when you're beginning new things. I've talked about this in different contexts, you know, and I've hammered it into my day-to-day -day in many ways, right? Like if I'm going on a run, you know, I have the running stuff by the door and ready to go with a glass of water the night before so that when I wake up, the process feels so easy that to not go would, would seem stupid. But life is complex, and so are we. It was a great reminder that your handle on something in one area of life doesn't mean you'll implement it across the board. And I was grateful for that reminder. It was what I needed at that time, right? The reminder that winning is going. Winning is beginning. 
because you're immersing yourself in the process and you're acclimating to it. You're seeing what works and what doesn't. You're growing as opposed to taking an extra three months to put into place parameters that will probably change anyway. One of my favorite mantras is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Powerful, but sometimes elusive. Right? But if you can keep it front and center, it adds immense value to your life. The most powerful thing you can do is have a general sense of direction and go now with what you have. Ashley and I will change our social media tactics many, many times in the future because we're collecting data and we're moving forward. Tyler and I will approach our venture in probably countless ways because we're not in love with a particular strategy, we're in love with the end goal. And perhaps you, in your world, are at a point where uh, you're seeking to initiate something new and you're playing with the pros and cons, you're listing ideas in your head categorizing details and nuance that, sure, it seems important right now in this moment, but will it forever, right? My advice to you is to mitigate detail and instead place the value on finding the courage to begin now. Before you're ready, before you have all the answers, before you know how X, Y, and Z is going to unfold, mitigate the friction to such an extent that you know, the pursuit feels like an ice hockey rink. You're sliding into whatever comes next. Never underestimate how powerful that is. And be reassured by the fact that in three months from now or a year from now, the journey won't look the same. You'll be better in execution and wiser in strategy because you simply created a low barrier to entry. You leverage perhaps the most important uh, ability you possess. You began. Every so often our paths lead us to a new door, a new opportunity to turn the handle and take a step into a world undiscovered. A metaphorical leap into what we can be. Not necessarily to escape our existing reality, but to build upon it, right? The truth is our existence, our potential, our capacity for greatness, it doesn't have a ceiling. It's not a glass of water that hits a point and spills over. We don't know where our genius ends. We've never seen our maximized capability. Our spirit ability to innovate, create, and change for the better, they know no bounds. And every time we walk up to one of these doors, right before we turn that handle, take that step, we're reminded of a very important truth. That this life has more in store. And that's incredible because where you look for opportunity, you find it. And by the way, this would be far less significant if we weren't so inclined to forget. We often mistake our present reality for the reality. It becomes easier to see what's wrong than right. The risk towers over and intimidates the reward. And rather than move forward, we stay where we are. But this door, this opportunity, this minute is a hand extended to you. It's an ally, it's a road sign, emphasizing that yesterday doesn't define you. You're not your past. You're what you do from here on out. We have the ability to change, grow, become what we've always wanted to be, but it requires first that we stop, if only for a minute. We stop and acknowledge that we have no clue what life would be like operating on all cylinders because we've never come close. It requires recognizing that our dreams become a reality when we remove the fictitious line that separates them. There's a famous saying, as you think, so you shall be. And before you 
dare step through that door, you have to acknowledge that. Soak it in. It is the single most important power granted to you. If you make excuses, you will become your excuses. But if you see the opportunity, you will always be greater tomorrow than you are today. This door presents options. You can spend half your life saying you're too young, the other half saying you're too old, or you can push that aside and move forward. This step is about no excuses. It's about no hesitation, no regrets, not complicating the things that are simple. We have a finite amount of time and you can either make the most of it or let it pass you by, that's it. Because before you reached this door, the little things held you back. The criticism kept you stagnant. Fear made regret seem okay. But now is different. There's magic here because it's here you can reassess what matters. You can remove the armor that was weighing you down. You can acknowledge that falling won't kill you. Get rid of safety at the expense of progress. Life has only begun. And right now, the only action that's required is that you close your eyes and you see the possibility. Nothing else. You create what's in front of you. You put it there. It's your narrative. So let this step and every step that follows take you to a world you dream of, not a world you've settled for. Sometimes all it takes is a reminder to help us realize what we have, what's possible, before you turn that handle. Leave the past behind you and move confidently into tomorrow. The path forward is not chance. It does not decide your fate, your greatness. You do. It's your decision. The path forward simply reinforces the choice you've made. So choose excellence and go make this year the best of your life. So I'm gonna share a life lesson with you, something that over the years has been a true game changer. Ready? It's simple. It's very simple. Like most things, it's easy to understand, it's easy to comprehend, it's the implementation that's the challenge, right? Uh, but it's the idea that progress is not always a visible step forward. Growth is not always a measurable inch or mile, you know, to feel good about, to celebrate. It's not always a tangible victory or pat on the back uh, to smile about. Sometimes it's sidestepping. Sometimes it's stepping backwards, reminding ourselves to look up and gain perspective. Because we are always inclined to look at the immediate. That's what feels good. And this lesson says, no, there's a big picture to keep in mind. It reels us in. The big picture is what gives us purpose. It drives our happiness. That thing we want on the top of the hill, the North Star, the X on the map, that's what's sustainable. And I say it's been a game changer for me because, you know, one of my biggest adversaries over the years has been that voice in my head, almost pleading with me to indulge in the thing that will bring that immediate result. It's money now, growth now, validation now. There's comfort there. Our minds want that satisfaction. That's why you see all those guys standing next to whiteboards saying they have the formula to make you rich tomorrow. We want tomorrow. We believe in some capacity that that can be real tomorrow, but that's what tends to lead us astray. And so I've spent a lot of time reflecting over the years on how to incentivize those steps that aren't immediately impactful. There's not the flashy metal you're going to get right now, but I know that if I do it, it's going to bring me to my long-term goal. How do I incentivize that? Because, like I said, the natural inclination is to dismiss it. I'm walking laterally across the mountain so that ultimately I can find the most applicable path 
and ascend. And that's a scary thing. You know, building long-term gives you uh, very little to immediately slap on a resume, to brag or rant about at holiday parties. There's nothing flashy to impress with, but it's believing in a long-term game, doing what most people can't, trading that certainty that you could have had for an extraordinary later. It's never a loss to do what has to be done so that you can position yourself for the future. Sometimes you have to wade through the muck, work quietly in the dark so that you can build something that you feel will have an impact. It's not a loss to step backwards to tweak the things you're not happy with. It's not a loss to explore or question or reinvent. It's true, those actions in and of themselves aren't going to put money immediately in your pockets. But if you find the discipline to see the big picture, you, know, you realize that long-term, those things bring happiness, contentment, excitement, which guess what? Leads to accomplishment and progress and the financial stability that, that, that you're looking for. Chasing flashy things, chasing the immediate moment, yeah, it gets you a quick rush, a nice blast of dopamine, but it's empty. Ultimately, it's unfulfilling because nothing worth having is quick. That's life. But it's often the illusion that guides us, right? You'll never see how many auditions the 33-year-old actor went through before he was cast in a major film. You don't see that. You don't see the countless hours and shows and midnight gigs in front of three people that the rock star endured. You just don't. It's not celebrated. We celebrate what we see. And what I've learned is that the most important things, they're just not visible to the naked eye. And it's funny. It's like people, uh, they're ashamed or embarrassed by the fact that they're climbing to the top of their own hill to something truly significant to them because the person next to them is bragging about blindly leaping three steps. Right? And that's great. Progress is great. But unless it's taking you to where you want to be most, is it a win? I have many friends that have left six-figure or higher jobs to podcast or create or start their own businesses. And people's first reaction is always like, wow, look what you have. Look what you're walking away from. We see scarcity. We are naturally inclined to see life through a lens of scarcity. You need to remember that. That's what we do. We establish and protect our well-being. That's why I've worked so hard to transform my thinking over the years. To look out and think, who cares what I had? Look what's out there. There are no limitations to what can be yours. If you're not on top of the world, make it happen. And I understand people are complex. Situations, they're not easy. They're intricate. Everyone's different. Everything is different. But there's a principle that's consistent. And it's that you can always improve your situation. That will never be false. To some degree, you can improve your situation. There's always opportunity. It's just what you see. A friend of mine sent me a text yesterday saying the past and the future, they're just imagination. All you have is now. Everything other than split second is the story you're deciding to tell yourself. That's it. Think about that. We're operating off what we decide is real or imaginary, possible or impossible. We're living in a world that is our own. There's no them or they or crowd, just individual people all telling themselves some variation of a story. And so taking this back to the point, caving into that pressure, accommodating to the now so that we feel important, so that our self-worth sees that temporary spike, it neglects the opportunity. It makes us feel like we're stepping forward, that we're progressing, but in reality, are we? You know, that voice, that pressure to conform to what will impress Richard next door uh, will always lead to, it will always be to our detriment. And it takes truly what I believe is the most pure, important aspect of life and sticks it in the closet so that we can feel like we're on par with everyone else. Now, I'll never forget starting out. Um, and I bring this up a lot because it was one of those, those moments where I knew, I recognized that a huge shift was happening in my life. Um, went out with some friends from college, right? And one's working for a senator, one's a Goldman, one's a lawyer. And I'm thinking, well, you know, geez, I just quit my job. Um, but I have this really cool idea for a YouTube channel. And I just, you know, I don't think any girls are going to be swooning over that. And I struggled, right? At the time, it was difficult for me. And I'm, I'm, I look back and I'm just thankful every day that at the time I was able to locate somewhere in my soul the courage to stick that out, to believe that if I executed on this dream, I could have an impact. Because like I mentioned above, it was painful in the moment. But when you think big picture, bigger things happen. Right? I'm doing things now that I never ever would have been able to do if I didn't have that, that desire to do the unconventional thing. 
if I stopped at, uh, at sort of the, the discomfort or if I stopped when I felt like I was losing this imaginary race to those people around me. I wouldn't have the creative flexibility that I have now. I wouldn't be able to do what I do now. I wouldn't have the people in my life that I have now. You have to earn that every single day. And it makes me wonder how many people stopped when they could have taken their own path, brought their own unique vision into existence if they didn't retreat when they felt like they were a lone wolf, when it felt like they were losing a race that didn't exist, when they felt like their neighbors were getting ahead or their classmates or their friends were doing the conventional thing, so they had to. They were too scared to step backwards. And I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you that step backwards, that ability to, to temporarily find yourself, to create yourself, that will mean everything. That will open doors for you that would never have existed. You never would have come across them because you would have been too scared to look for them. You have to make opportunities. Simple metaphor, gumball machine. Gumball does not come out if you don't put the quarter in and turn it. It's a price that has to be paid. Except in reality, the price is a lot higher than a quarter because we're conditioned to want to fit in. We're terrified to look like we don't know what we're doing. Every significant thing around you stemmed from someone pushing into that unknown. It came from someone risking everything. It's not easy when your family doesn't know what you're doing, your friends don't know what you're doing, or, or you don't know what you're doing. But if you want to have an impact, that is the road you have to take. That's the cost you need, the price that you need to pay. It'll be a hard year or two years or three years, but you won't regret it. So hopefully this can be a reminder to you. When I talk about lateral steps, that's the sentiment I'm trying to recreate. You know, I think that's the great thing because it means the people who create, who build something meaningful, they've earned it. And that's what I tell myself every day, earn that dream, earn that change, right? Take that road less traveled. What you're doing right now is not insignificant simply because it's not immediately bearing fruit. I think if you listen to this back from the top, you'll, you'll notice the constant theme, immediate, now, present. These things are delusion, right? As far as results are concerned, the word immediately is a con artist. Action should be immediate, but results, no, they are gradual. They require persistence. Stick with it. Remind yourself to look up because that's what you're after. It's a pursuit. You're building a foundation. You're creating the things that permanently alter the artistic and political and social landscapes. That's remarkable. It's the road few have the patience to walk. Remind yourself why you're skipping the small stuff, brushing off the little wins and losses. And why building something substantial in silence is more powerful than gloating and screaming at the top of your lungs after every visible step. Look up. Remind yourself that you are going to change the world and you can see it. Be loved or be hated, but never simply tolerated. In life, you can live to chase opportunity or you can live to avoid failure. And there are two very different things. Rather than pursue, we often avoid. We avoid failure. We avoid criticism. We don't want to ruffle feathers or disrupt. No, we choose to simply exist. Never condemned, but never extraordinary. Just tolerate. And it's an interesting dilemma. Because the best things exist on the extremes. Life's fringes. That's where you find your accolades, your accomplishments. That's what we celebrate. It's where you need to be. And you get there not by worrying about what everyone around you thinks, but by taking your strength, your unique self, holding on and pressing the pedal to the floor, going all in. And yeah, that means suddenly, my friend, you are exposed. 
you are vulnerable, you are now out there. It means those who don't have the courage to chase their dreams, they will find you threatening and they will let you know. But it also means that the shackles are off. The door is open, the light is green and you can build from the ground up. You can build the life you want. The finish line has now become more visible than the prospect of falling along the way and you've granted yourself permission to run through it. Sure, some will love you for these accomplishments, some will hate you for these accomplishments, but let me reiterate the word accomplishment. Because when you live to be invisible, it's a term that rarely presents itself, I promise. Life, it rewards the bold. Those who are bold in their beliefs, bold in their actions, their dreams, and their pursuits, they are not for anyone but you. And years later, when you look in the mirror, you'll know that you gave every single thing you had to a life that meant something to you. Loved, yes. Hated, sure. But merely tolerated, no. There's a haze that circles around our most important moments. And I say haze because often the things that will uh, be most meaningful in our lives or that will best position us for future transformation or success, they don't accurately depict the value that they ultimately provide. In fact, a lot of the time we get the opposite impression. The answer is deceptively masked as the problem, the thing we are most inclined to run away from. It's often unclear to us that the pain we're experiencing will become the purpose. The loss will become the strength. We can't always see that losing the job will become our reason to find ourselves and the work that will be most meaningful. We don't always understand that Losing someone that was a big part of our lives will ultimately create a little space that will bring about connection with others who will lift us up and make us better. We aren't always aware that falling short is incredibly powerful because it's what most often prompts us to look in the mirror and ask that magical question, how can I be better? Again, we see it in a million different ways, different contexts. The solutions masquerade as problems, or as has been famously put, the way often presents itself as the obstacle. Which means we have to operate with a sense of awareness and understanding that often eludes us. Sometimes the reality is that it hurts to let go. But if it's not right for you, it hurts to hold on as well. The difference is when you do find the strength to let go, you simultaneously create space for the things that will make your life better. And I've noticed, you know, as I've navigated this crazy place well into my 30s, that the discomfort I've experienced in the past, it rarely uh, utilizes my future as its benchmark, right? When I'm uncomfortable, it's because something has gone awry in the now. This moment hurts. In this moment, I feel less than. In this moment, I feel lost. In this moment, I am X, Y, or Z. It's all generally immediate, emotive responses to what's happening which is why I advocate so strongly for pausing, pulling back, taking a breath, and assessing the whole picture in totality. See, I've made decisions in my life that have set me back 
a year, right? That destroyed me emotionally, totally altered my plans. And I look back on some of those decisions now with all the pain they brought. And I think, you know, was there another way? Did I make the right move? Did I need to endure all that? And I'm not gonna pretend, you know, I know how some parallel universe would have unfolded if I acted differently. But as I reflect back, I still think that I made the right choice. I don't see another way. Sometimes there are no easy decisions. Sometimes life is about choosing the least bad option. I've talked about having to step back in order to leap forward or stepping sideways in order to ultimately advance. Sometimes the thing we need just looks like discomfort. The sheep in wolves clothing, where you have to seek out monsters in order to destroy the ones that live inside of you. The reason, one, I think this is so important, and two, I'm so passionate about sharing it with others is because, again, our instincts drive us away from the things we need most. That's just how it is. Humans are more uh, emotional than we are rational. And there have been plenty of times where, you know, just being reminded, you know, Eddie, I get that this is challenging, but where do you most want to go? Eddie, you're playing defensive, which I'm sure minimizes problems now, but will never propel you forward with your career. Eddie, you're dragging your feet and calling it perfectionism. Could it in fact be fear? Right? I've had a lot of these little, uh, and sometimes not so little, epiphanies over the course of the last decade. You know, when people ask me about speaking, which being that I do it for a living would make sense, right? Tips or insights, whatever it is, I'm being completely sincere when I say that I wish I had some formula I could propose, right? That would make you go from zero to 60 in three months. But the truth is the biggest bang for your buck is stepping right into the terror. The thing you're most inclined to run from. And that was it for me, right? Sheer terror, actually shaking. Nights where I stayed awake, reciting keynotes into hotel mirrors. Couldn't eat. And I'd, you know, wrap up, the event would be over. I'd just go back to the room and collapse in bed because I hadn't slept the night before, right? That's how it started. And the more times I didn't give myself a way out, the more I saw past the fear, put emotions aside and reiterated to myself that underneath all that discomfort was value, the better I became. The less dramatic each speaking engagement became. And the terror evolved into excitement. Eddie, please get through this, eventually evolved into Eddie, how can you make this speaking engagement more exciting, more fun, more captivating than the last one? Right. I recently spoke at the MGM Grand Arena and it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. And I'm sure you can imagine, not necessarily because of the event, but it prompted me to think back to all those times I wanted to say no so badly with all my heart, with every fiber of my being, but didn't. It was just a proud feeling. Like you get those moments from time to time where everything becomes a single snapshot. It all makes sense. Because right? over times I truly didn't understand why I was moving forward, I just did. I just knew I'd burn the boats, there were no other options. And when you collect that W, you quickly remember. And so all this to emphasize the very important point that it may not be speaking at the MGM Grand Arena that's your North Star. Maybe it's something totally different. But I want to remind you that the road to wherever you most want to be is not perfectly paved and decorated with flowers. It won't always be sunny with clear blue skies. And to take it even further, the paths that are paved with flowers and clear blue skies are often the wrong ones. In a world of trade-offs, we know that the best things often require the greatest sacrifice. The beautiful things are often derived from a willingness to endure prior turbulence. 
And should you find yourself amidst all that, in the thick of it, it's essential to know that should you choose to do so, you can transform the chaos into something incredible. Realistically, that pain of loss, we can't do anything about, right? Nature has made it so that we feel every sense of what's been taken away. But nature doesn't do such a good job of reminding us of the infinite value that can now move into our souls, be used to open our eyes so that we may see the world as we've never seen it before. There is such power in the ability to view that fleeting emotion, the discomfort of now, in terms of what it will ultimately become. As the saying goes, the hardest thing and the right thing are often the same thing. So be your own judge, your own critic. Decide what best points you to that place amongst the stars you long to be. Just understand that the road won't be pain-free, and those who try to make it so miss out on a lot of the brilliance available to us. That haze that tries to conceal what's most important is only effective if we keep our eyes closed, if we aren't honest with ourselves. But if you know, one, what's most important, and two, are committed to one day arriving there, the short-term obstacles become a relatively small price to pay. Sometimes the inspiration doesn't come to you. No, sometimes you have to go out and find it. When it hurts the most, when the deck seems stacked against you, when the road to travel seems to be longer than you can endure. These are the times we're tasked, not with waiting, but with creating. And those lows, they become highs because they force us to self-assess, to look around and say, I don't want to feel this way anymore. I'm done tolerating X, accepting Y, associating with Z, and so a bridge must be created to something. And your question, is simply what's that something going to look like? Here's what's interesting. Knowing what you don't want is often the beginning. It breathes life into a first step. Maybe you look up and you have no idea what step 2,000 or 3,000 looks like, and that's perfectly okay. You don't need to know exactly where you're headed, exactly what the top of the mountain will look like. What took me forever to figure out is knowing that here isn't right for you, wherever here is, is enough. Because it is the beginning, the engine that makes it all work. You don't owe explanations, apologies aren't required of you. All you needed was that feeling in your stomach that more is out there and perhaps you've been depriving yourself of it for a tad too long. You just need to leave scarcity behind and train your eyes to find the abundance you exist within. The other day I saw a quick interview Tiger Woods was giving. And I'm not really a big golf guy, but when the greats talk, I listen. And those who have been following him know that he's had kind of a rocky past, right? A very public, uh, you know, family situation to injuries, surgeries, a recent car accident. And you can only want someone like that to rise from the ashes, right? I feel like everyone's rooting for him to rediscover the dominance he once possessed. And basically in this interview, 
the interviewers asking him about day one of the Masters, where Tiger played well enough to make the cut. You know, he survived day one and was about to continue uh, the, the tournament into the weekend, but it certainly wasn't the best golf he's ever played. And so upon reflecting on it, he says, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, things aren't the way I'd like them to feel, but I've given myself a chance. And I love the way that sounded, right? Not just because it came from a man who's been metaphorically battling uphill for what feels like some time now, but because it's how we all reemerge from our adversity. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. Your past, all of it, the ups and downs, the bumps and bruises, they've all brought you here. And if life is one giant tournament, you've made the cut. You get to play in your masters. Tomorrow is coming. And it brings with it the chance to right the ship to discover the undiscovered, to find yourself again. By showing up today, you've given yourself a chance, and that is the most powerful thing one can possess, a chance. I think too often we look at what we don't have. We spend our time focusing on the holes, the blank spaces, the gaps. Instead of looking at the opportunity we've created to pivot wherever we deem necessary, the flexibility is the asset, but only valuable when we recognize and utilize it. And yeah, that can feel like a tall order when we are not at our best. When we're operating at a level that, let's say, is less than ideal. It's easy to see all the problems we're going through as supporting evidence that the world is bigger than us, that we are outmatched by life. But really, all these things that have come together to create our current state, they're nothing more than life providing you a chance, an opportunity to turn the page. And with Tiger, you know, those lows, those setbacks, and perhaps even the personal anguish one would assume would uh, accompany those things, they've given him the gift of now. And he recognizes that. Just like everything that has paved the way for you has done the same. It's created the conditions from which you can now grow, further evolve providing a little nudge towards those things we need to do, but maybe sometimes drag our feet a little too long. So when the world throws you curveballs, how about seeing this situation as a chance to hit off speed, to step up to the plate and make something of what we thought was misfortune? When one trades, it's happening to me, for it's happening for me, you're presented advantages that were previously unavailable. They weren't there. And not because they didn't exist. They weren't there because they weren't recognized. Because perhaps you saw the very thing that could help you as the thing that would hurt you. But regardless, here you are, sharpened by the mistakes you made and shaped by the lessons you learned. You are here, not to relive the past, but to create a new reality, write a new chapter, walk a new path. You are here. And wherever next happens to be, let it unfold because you chose it. Let it evolve because it's who you are. Leave the stands and make your way to the stage 
where sure, the stakes are higher, but so is the upside. I often talk about the power of looking over our shoulders at those highs and lows from time to time. Not because they have power over us, but because they have made us powerful. Look at all you've endured. See all that you've overcome, and for what? Well, to put it simply, for the gift currently at your fingertips. The chance to say years from now that sure, you lost yourself. Things became chaotic, confusing, convoluted. Maybe you were unsure. Maybe at times you even felt alone, but those times, the same times that could have kept you down, instead reminded you what you were capable of becoming. You don't get the light at the end of the tunnel without walking through the darkness. And so to remember that, that all this has unfolded to bring about something beautiful on the other side, well, that just might be the perspective that you've needed, that you've left behind. The world will only give you what you ask for. And so right here, right now, instead of accepting a continuation of your past, how about demanding an evolution of yourself? That game of life awaits. And so for your sake and the world's, don't be afraid to play. Running into the storm. When the skies are black, the wind pushing me backwards, everyone and everything around me running away in the opposite direction. Yet I continue on, step by step to the heart of the dark, looming, ominous unknown. Is there doubt in some capacity? Yeah, of course there is. When everyone around you is acting in unison, doing the same thing, any rational mind's going to stop and ask why. Do they know something I don't know? Perhaps. Yet, I continue on. Initially, the struggle isn't even physical. Raindrops fall, the temperature cools, the wind intensifies. I have to put a little more emphasis into every step, but there's no pain. At the beginning, the struggle is mental. It's a war of ideas, that unsettling feeling in your stomach. And whatever this is, this darkness overhead, it's certainly out of their comfort zone. Should it be out of mine? Am I brave or crazy, wise or naive, living on the edge or just being stupid? How fine is that line? Why expose yourself when the world takes shelter? What should I be afraid of? The water, the sound of thunder, the one in 280 million odds of a lightning strike? Why can't I completely separate my endeavors from theirs? Am I just wired to care this much? Man, just run. Turn up the music, add the miles, count the steps. Remember, I will understand why I'm doing this. This seemingly trivial pursuit, I know the pieces will add up. They always add up. Eddie, just trust yourself. Push through the heaviness in your legs. Isolate the fear, the anxiety, the emotion that causes humans to act on impulse. To act irrationally. Your job isn't to follow precedent here. It's not to conform to normal or do what anyone else does. It's to continue into the storm. And I do. And then, like all things, it ends. 
I arrive. I hit my turning point, my destination, still alive, predictably unharmed, but uneasy. Like I missed the memo. Like I'm disrespecting this norm at the expense of an unwritten social contract. However, I am in too deep now. I'm obviously not calling a cab. I'm halfway there, so I am running back. And the second I make that 180 degree transition to part two of my journey, I get it. I mean, you really can't help but get it. The light bulb has to illuminate. The wind is now at my back. Not only is it pushing me along, it's pushing me along after having to trudge through it for miles. The tables have turned. Now it's this buy one, get one kind of deal, and I don't think I could slow down if I wanted. The previous stress and resistance had me work overtime simply so I could acquire and appreciate this feeling of bliss. It reminded me of the old days. Sitting down on the floor after a 2K test on the erg, dead, winded, exhausted, finding peak happiness in just being removed from the hell that had just transpired. In that window, you see life differently. I could walk up to that same spot and sit down any day of the week and it would mean nothing. But after that 2,000 meters, it was heaven. And here I am recapturing a small piece of that on this very sidewalk. The sidewalk that I walk down all the time, unaware, unmoved, but now I am light. I am flying, suddenly becoming less and less aware of my surroundings. The streets are empty, but they might as well be Times Square in December. I'm in a world of my own. And look, I understand why most people would skip this little excursion altogether. The first 50%, it is sheer intimidation. The castle walls threaten. But don't people wonder what's inside? Don't they know that you can't learn to fight back at life if you don't allow yourself to get hit or take a jab once in a while? Look, the point is not the run or the storm or the street. The point is that you don't know what you don't know. And a life of continuously seeking shelter ensures that ignorance lives on. If you continuously follow the crowd, you don't get to carve out a space for yourself. You don't taste excellence, that moment of temporary euphoria. And sometimes I forget that. Honestly, it's easy to forget that, but that is why I run. There's always the initial question, the physical and mental turmoil, the pulsing temptation to just stop. After all, this is definitionally unnecessary. I could go away, I could live, wake up every day and exist without this. It's not needed, it's not required, but at some point, whether it's the middle, the end, or after I've crossed the finish line, I remember. At some point, it always hits me. I'm awarded that feeling of completion, a high that can't be found unless you've paid for it. See, people run towards security. People run towards safety because it's instinct, because they don't know. These trivial runs they teach me over and over again that you literally do not know what you're missing until you grab fear by the hand and take it along for the ride. And yes, I feel doubt. Yes, I feel the anxiety of the unknown. But they don't stop me. They don't dictate my result. They are nothing more than those dark skies overhead and the rain in my face. They are along for the ride. I run through them while they watch, silently observing as I transform into something extraordinary. That discomfort, it did not deter me, it made me, and that's why I run. You don't have to know everything. 
In fact, you don't even need to know most things. But you do have to know that progress often calls for us to move forward without knowing. It asks that we're willing to learn along the way, to pick up the pieces as we walk by them. And that's a vulnerability that is sometimes tough to face, right? It's a nakedness that we never really shake. The idea that in order to grow, we have to leave the now ill-prepared for tomorrow, but knowing that we have everything we need to make the transition. The losses become lessons, the failures become data points, the mistakes become our clarity. And until we understand this, there really isn't an upward trajectory. We place too much value on the known, the things we understand, the cyclical nature of a day-to-day -day that is, as much as life can be, predictable and determined. Characteristics that are actually antithetical to growth. In fact, one could make an argument that in this incredible day and age of information, our need and ability to know often comes at the expense of true transformation. Right? I studied podcasts for so long before I started one that I could have created and improved upon my own, I don't know, 400 times over. I had to find out who uses what, when to upload, how long the episode should be, and on and on. There are books and videos, there are classes and coaches. All of it wonderful, I'm sure, in, in its own way. But nothing so powerful as that university of experience, of life. The idea of the thinker and the doer. The thinker that absorbs and contemplates, weighs one option versus another and another. Exhausting time sufficient for the doer to fall on her face twice, pick up the pieces, make necessary changes, and be on her way. See, the information is out there. It exists and can be incredibly valuable but simultaneously can contribute to us thinking our way into stagnation. A thing can only be what you make it. Right? Things provide the value you decide to extract from them. I like using the example of water because it's simple. Water is necessary to sustain life. Without it, one cannot go on. Too much of it, however, can sink a ship or flood a building. Too much is disastrous. And you can, you know, pretty much fill in the blank with anything else here to demonstrate that point. Life is a balance between not enough and too much. Scarcity and excess. But my opinion is that now, with regard to information and technology, we exist on the too much side of the spectrum. I mean, I can't even remember the last time I was having a conversation about something I wasn't sure about without interrupting it to pull out my phone and Google the answer. Again, this has its positives. Knowledge is power, but to what extent? And I'm talking big picture here. This is about so much more than, you know, picking up a phone to Google information. This is about never feeling like we're equipped enough to step into something new because we can always be obtaining more. And it's like, where do you draw that line? I now, because of the accessibility of information, find myself frequently uh, staring like a deer in headlights because some minor detail hasn't been made clear to me because everything is not perfectly ironed out. My brain has become conditioned to know because knowing is now incredibly easy. But life is about generating a meaningful existence. Meaning is carved from unknowns. 
It's not Googled or found on Wikipedia. A podcast or YouTube video can't give you meaning. They might help you prepare or point you in the right direction, but meaning is about self-discovery. It's about, yeah, taking those things you learn, but giving them life. You know, it's pulled out of the world around you like diamonds from the earth. Necessarily calling for going when you don't know exactly what the destination looks like. Starting when you don't know what the end result will be. We are consuming at the expense of living. Absorbing at the expense of feeling, right? There's the idea that a business book is not the same thing as creating a business. Being on social media is not the same thing as being social. It's an aspect of those things served up without the risk or the upside. That is not real life. In one of my favorite movies, Good Will Hunting, Robin Williams' character, uh, a therapist, is talking to Matt Damon's character. He plays this brilliant young man who has, you know, a photographic memory. He's read every book in the library. He's a genius. But even with all that, he he doesn't quite have the courage to move out of his little world into something bigger, into the opportunity that's available for him if only he'd find the strength to seek it out. And here's a segment of Robin Williams trying to explain that to Matt Damon. He says... So if I asked you about art, you'd probably give me this skinny on every art book ever written. Michelangelo, you know a lot about life's work, political aspirations, him and the Pope, sexual orientation, whole works, right? But I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. You've never actually stood there and looked up at that beautiful ceiling, seen that. If I asked you about women, you'd probably give me a syllabus on your personal favorites. You may have even been late a few times, but you can't tell me what it feels like to wake up next to a woman and feel truly happy. You're a tough kid. I asked you about war and you'd probably throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watched him gasp his last breath looking to you for help. I look at you, I don't see an intelligent, confident man. I see a cocky, scared kid. And the quote goes on, but the idea is a powerful one. And one of the reasons I've rewatched that scene over and over, it's not that he's trying to belittle the character. He's trying to help him explore the depths of his own personality, his needs and desires, trying to arm him with the understanding that he's strong enough to move beyond the walls he's built around himself, that all that knowledge he's obtained and acquired is meaningless unless he gives it life. Knowing isn't enough. And I want to qualify this again because it's important you meet me where I am. I'm not making a case for ignorance or, you know, books, knowledge, understanding. That's critical, but it's the other piece that makes life worth living. You don't get the reward without the risk, and the risk requires that one moves into the haze without clear understanding of an outcome. It's moving into life without total certainty. And we are hardwired for that certainty. We're built to want to know. And now on top of that, we have the tools uh, to take in infinite knowledge. I want this to be a reminder that we have to circumnavigate that idea to some extent. We have to trust ourselves to figure things out as we go. That waiting until we have everything figured out simply leaves the door cracked for regret to sneak in and make itself comfortable. There's an entire world out there waiting for you not to have it all figured out, but to instead stumble upon the realization that you don't have to know. To move forward, you have to simply trust. That's when the world will transform before your eyes.
I want to talk about a myth. And it's, it's a myth, it's an idea that's commonplace in our lives and it's rooted in a lot of the decisions we make as well as the actions that we do not take. And it's this idea of certainty, of a formula, something that's already out there that will get you from point A to point B. See, breaking it down further, there are two things you need to know about certainty. One is that it's an idea derived from fiction. There's no way of knowing exactly what the top of the mountain will look like. And waiting for that to materialize, to have that crystal clear step-by-step -step formula, it creates stagnation. We don't have perfection, so we don't move. It's one of those things where you wait and days turn to days and more days and weeks and months and years and eventually regret. Why? Because we were not certain. And what do we do? See, this leads to the second piece. We study everything, right? We live in a time where we have access to unlimited resources. And it's this incredible thing, right? We can study the, the, the LeBron James, the Jeff Bezos, the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world. We can see exactly what they did. We can see how they think, how they approach problems, how they get to solutions. And on one hand, it's an unbelievable benefit. Knowledge is power. But on the other hand, there's a cost. And this cost can be extremely detrimental because it mitigates the most important thing in your life, and that is your unique self. What makes you valuable? What do you bring to the world? What makes you tick? And I'll tell you right now, you do not find that by studying how Jeff Bezos started Amazon and attempting to duplicate it. You don't find that by simply copying LeBron James' workout routine. Your value, your source of happiness, you know, that's discovered moving forward through ups and downs, falling and getting back up, not once, not twice, but repeatedly. And it's through those trials and tribulations that you carve out who you are. But if you wait for the perfect moment, you'll never find it, which means you will never go through this process. I often think back to my days in the corporate world, in the insurance industry, being in a situation that I was not thriving in. And if someone sat me down and said, Eddie, what do you want to do? What is the top of the mountain? What does success look like to you? I couldn't answer that. But what I did know is that I loved to create. I loved to speak, to write, compose music, produce videos, just put out content. That's what I was destined to do and I knew it. But if I waited to move until I knew exactly what my life would look like, until there was, you know, this path perfectly paved to the finish line, I'd still be there. I'd be in a, a, a cubicle crunching numbers in Excel in a weirdly painted beige room. But sometimes you have to move forward. Trust your gut, your instincts, what you love to do. Embrace the idea, the fact that you'll fall down and you'll fall down and you'll get back up, but that it will shape you. And that as you go on living your passion, your purpose, thriving in life, the pieces come together. You have to trust that even when it's not certain, because I'll tell you what is certain. If you do not move, you will not achieve. That world will spin right around you. I read a book a few months ago called Hatching Twitter. Simple read, it's about the founders of Twitter, Jack, Ev, all these guys with their different ideas and different you know, notions of, of, of what this company is gonna be. You know, it started out as, I believe, a radio, online radio company, and it evolved, and it evolved, and there were pivots and adjustments and alterations, and they kept moving forward and they kept growing. And there's one point where they have a valuation of millions and millions of dollars. And they're having a conversation like, what do we, what is our company? 
Is, is real-time news the focus? Are we promoting social interaction? Like, what is it? How do we brand this? How do we market it? What do we have on our hands? This is a company worth millions of dollars. Talk about just moving forward, taking it one step at a time. Things will change, they'll evolve, but you have to give yourself an opportunity for that to happen. Imagine if they never left the garage or whatever room they started the company in because they didn't know what it would be in 2017. We wouldn't have Twitter. And that applies to everything around us, right? We have this idea that, you know, things were meant to be, they were destined. No, things exist around us because of risks that were taken, because people pushed forward until they got a result, until they knew what they were meant to do and it materialized, and that is life. So don't be scared to take that step. Don't be nervous to fall down. You need that. The world needs that because without it, we'll have could be's and some days, but not the existence that we want, that you deserve, that you're capable of acquiring. No longer is certainty the standard, Progress is the standard, and your life will change. A life well lived is a dance between having the strength to walk away and having the courage to go all in. It's juggling the idea that absolutely nothing matters and the idea that every second is a blessing beyond which I'm capable of even explaining or articulating. Nothing matters. So live without limits or constraints, like you're on a once in a lifetime journey. But everything matters. So know that every second along the way is perfect, a building block, a microcosm of the universe resting in the palm of your hand. And I think about this push pull from time to time. I play with the idea that nothing matters when I need courage, when I need to convince myself to be a little bolder, reinforce the understanding that there is no pressure here. Life can only give what I'm willing to carve out. And as that clock ticks away in the background, what do I have to lose? As Mark Twain put it, it's the things we don't do that we come to regret. And then on the other side, when I need a little discipline, I play with the idea that the little things are everything. After all, two things can be true at once, and the details matter a lot. For me, getting up two hours earlier does make a difference. That pushing a little harder will add up. The little things become everything. And painting that portrait that had been tucked away in my imagination, well, that's done one very real, very tangible brushstroke at a time. It's participating in that dance between nothing and everything, the real and the imaginary. But for the time being, let's leave those very important little things and focus on the divine big things those nothings that with some vision and concentrated effort become some things. I have a friend that says to me all the time, nothing matters. And not in a nihilistic, you know, throw your hands up and stay inside until the end of time type way. But in a way that poses the question, 
Why wouldn't you risk it all? Nothing matters. Why wouldn't you risk seeing how far you could push, how long you could run, how much you could become? Because maybe, just maybe, this whole thing isn't as serious as we'd like to think it is. And instead of feeling confined and scared, what if you felt alive, blessed to even be here? And I think realizing that we build these imaginary boxes around ourselves and live within them is a huge step. That awareness that we spend so much time reaching out for things that will save us when in reality, we simply need to set ourselves free. We need to open the gates, build bridges to the infinite opportunity that surrounds us. And when I think about this, a feeling that still comes to mind, feeling I had after 2K tests in college. Those of you that have been on the rowing machines, I'm sure you get it. But if not, picture a feeling similar to an all-out sprint for roughly six or seven minutes, depending on when you cross the line. And when it was over, after I'd finished picking myself up, I would just sit in the hallway, cherish the feeling of being done. Right After pushing my body to its maximum, I'd appreciate the nothingness, the same nothingness that I'd never pay attention to at all otherwise. But in that moment, it was everything. What a gift. As you regain your composure, as your heart rate comes back down to earth, to just be still. And I still love that feeling after physical exertion, the reminder to just be thankful for a moment of serenity, a reminder that life can and will inflict upon us these periods of absolute chaos, of turbulence. And often they're very necessary. They harden us, they shape us, but they also remind us to appreciate their absence. Well, same thing goes, and a lot of you I'm sure will be able to relate to this for something like a headache or a migraine. You know, when they come and go in my life, it's like the second a brutal headache dissipates, that nothingness is the greatest gift I could ever imagine. The absence of pain infinitely more valuable than any tangible acquisition. And I think in those moments, we get a glimpse of the world in its purest, simplest form, where all the nuance and detail we worry about doesn't matter much. Because look at what we have. Look how much surrounds us when we position ourselves to notice, when we simply pay attention. Tolstoy said, If then I were asked for the most important advice I could give, that which I consider to be the most useful to the men of our century, I should simply say, in the name of God, stop a moment. Cease your work. Look around you. An incredible reminder to never forget where we are or what we were given. To remember that by breathing in the air around us, we have, in a sense, already won. And I love this because for a brief moment in time, it swings that pendulum to the nothing matters side of life. When you're living a miracle, why sweat the small stuff? And I can ask myself, why do I get so worked up? It's no big deal. Why not take the risk? What's the worst case? that I fail and have to backtrack as a now more informed and knowledgeable person, why not stand in the face of my fears? The upside is consistently enticing. It consistently rewards. Look around and see what life has provided. How dare we waste it? And with that said, I'd also be remiss not to include this little caveat. You know, I'm careful with the words, nothing matters. Because even though in the context I've been using it for years, it's a, it's a positive, empowering thing. It's my reminder to push boundaries. I can also see how it begs the question, 
Well, if nothing matters, why should I care? And so let's reframe. Because it's not that nothing matters, it's that nothing outside the scope of your worldview matters. It's the acquisition of freedom, addition by the subtraction of all those externalities we let hold us back. Because you know as well as I do, it's not really the externalities that shackle you. It's your thoughts about them. So open the gate to your mind, let the detrimental out, and keep the necessary and the ideal in. Nothing matters if it doesn't align with your values and your destination. I know I say in every video, speech, podcast episode that we are the authors of our own stories. And it's because we craft our nothings and our everything. It's because your universe, the one behind your eyes, it needs a maker every morning. And if you allow it, each sunrise can be your genesis, your own beautiful creation story. You have your hand on the dial. And so amidst this world of infinite beauty and opportunity, Look around you, soak it all in, ask yourself, what does freedom look like, feel like? Because you were put here to pursue that. And outside of those parameters, I believe that nothing matters. So why not live like it, dream like it? Use the little thing in front of you to build the big things that have not yet arrived. Walk away when it's misaligned and go all in when you know in your soul it's right. There is everything to gain and nothing to lose. We spend a lot of time and we exhaust a lot of effort looking for that so-called edge. Capturing the little changes or advantages that add value and ultimately push us closer to where we want to be. Right, these so-called life hacks are everywhere. From, you name it, reshuffling daily tasks to activities, you know, exercises that enhance our performance, food, supplements, apps, the list goes on and on and I'm, Speaking broadly here intentionally because that quote-unquote edge could mean a million different things to a million different people. Obviously, tremendous value there in finding ways to become better, faster, and stronger. But why this topic excites me and, and what I'm specifically looking forward to exploring is what I believe to be the most important advantage there is, and that's consistency. Consistency, the unsexy, unremarkable answer, right? But you can always distill everything else down into that simple art of showing up, being there every day. To me, that begins it all. That will always be the foundation we build everything on. Over time, it becomes the reason you win or you lose, and I believe that wholeheartedly. Like, nothing matters if you aren't locked in and repeatedly making the daily effort. No pill is gonna make you a starting point guard or a stellar performer at work or, you know, an amazing parent that's dedicated, concentrated, consistent effort. A metaphor I like that demonstrates this process to me is trying to get fit, right? Whether you run or go to the gym, whatever it is, it's much easier to stay home and take creatine, protein, supplements, than to actually show up to the gym every day, than to actually put in the miles every day, right? 
But without showing up, all that other stuff is meaningless. And that's the heart of what I'm getting at. It's the lifting that's transformative. Everything else is supplemental. It's even in the term, right? Supplements. Now, is this obvious? Sure. But man, do we forget the obvious, and there is a hefty price for doing so. It's like, yeah, we should look for advantages along the way. And this becomes more and more relevant, uh, you know, the longer we've been immersed in the process. Those little details mean more and more, but they never mean more than having a goal and committing to it every single day. Never forget that. Showing up is power. There's a few quotes I like um, by James Clear, who's considered by many to be an expert on habit building, that hammer down on the power of consistency. And, uh, he says, improving by 1% isn't particularly notable. Sometimes it isn't even noticeable but it can be far more meaningful, especially in the long run. Right? It goes on to say, if you can get 1% better each day for one year, you'll end up being 37 times better by the time you're done. And I think that's what gets me, right? That line, 1% better every day means 37 times better in a year. Nothing can replicate that. There are no shortcuts to arrive at that type of progress or growth, none. And sure, the environment can change. There are times where the landscape shifts right under your feet. You have to reach further outside your comfort zone than you ever have. But that's still a product of your commitment to improve every single day. The context changes, the details change, but you still show up. 1% is essentially a rhythm, it's automated. It says, just like breathing air and drinking water, this is what I do, a dollar in the bank every day. What you're doing is giving life to a compound effect that will change everything. In my world, my showing up is every day, how do I become a little bit better at storytelling? How do I refine that intersection of personal development and entertainment so that you know we can uh, enjoy and get the most out of the journey? How do I make this brand matter a little more, mean a little more, be a little more effective? That's my Super Bowl every day. And funny story, I was driving this morning listening to a podcast about AI. Right? Everyone seems to be talking about AI right now and for good reason. I heard one of the guests say that in 10 years, there will be two types of businesses. Those that successfully leverage AI and those that failed and are no longer in existence. And it's a hypothesis, obviously, but it's eye-opening, right? AI is going to change everything. And I had to check my initial instinct that was honestly, oh, here we go, right? Another way for people to cut corners and cheat and I, I had to pause and think about it. Like, that's just a terrible way uh, to look at a new technology. That's a scarcity mindset. Instead, think about the opportunity. Remind yourself that you show up every day with the same mission and the same goal. You'll earn that 1% every day. And this is just another supplement to your growth. Right? Utilize correctly, at least in the current moment, this is whey protein or creatine for your lifting at the gym. So leverage it, right? That's all. Same with any new technology. And there was comfort there. There was comfort in looking back at thinking, look at all the previous technology, it's evolution. Look at the social platforms, how we interact now. Through it all, the changes, the highs, lows, ups and downs, you showed up. You held on to that North Star and over and over again made necessary adjustments. Right? That commitment has been everything. YouTube's algorithm changes did not kill me. It ended up making me a better storyteller, writer, speaker. COVID, you know, pushing my live speaking engagements aside for a while, causing me to further digitize my business model, that didn't hurt me. It made the brand bigger. 
short form content, blasting off onto the scene, TikToks, IG reels, that didn't hurt me. It forced me to be smarter and more thoughtful about how to integrate short term content into my long form content, how to make them work together. It ended up being an advantage. Right? The bottom line being, when you are consistent, when you show up for your thing, no matter what, no matter what changes are occurring, no matter what's happening externally, when you're there for your mission, that allows you to make whatever little changes need to be made along the way. Being there for yourself, committing to the twists and turns is everything. And it may be extreme to say, especially in such a rapidly changing environment right now, but my mentality is, who cares? Who cares about all the detail and the minutia and the externality? Who cares? You know what matters. You know what you're here to do. So keep that front and center. Simplicity being the ultimate sophistication doesn't get simpler, show up. Never let that 1% that James Clear talks about out of your sight. And then make the adjustments as necessary. Integrate the life hacks and the tech evolutions. Right, Fighting for that 1% every single day becomes 37 times better in a year. Think about how powerful that is. Let the world argue over this and that. Let them be on this path versus that path. Your strength is entrusting yourself to adjust along the way. But knowing that through it all, you will be there every morning when the sun comes up, the light moves through your window. You'll wake up committed to being a little better than you were yesterday. And that's why through it all, the turbulence, the highs, the lows, the ups and the downs, you will still be standing there ready for whatever comes next. One of the most important lessons I've learned is that I already have what I need most. And now, as I unpack this, think of it not in a, a fluffy, uh, sort of your magical, just the way you are context. And instead, let's look at it through a, a truly practical lens. Hey, okay, life is about connecting dots. And I personally believe there's a way to make almost anything happen. You just need to figure out what dots have to be connected to get there. And, you know, even if this message isn't true 100% of the time, uh, me believing in it, believing it so, has pushed me to find ways to succeed when I otherwise would have walked away. To me, it's a 100% value add. So, Let's dive in. Let's say you're, you're currently going through a rut in life, just not feeling good about yourself, how things are. Okay, we've all been there in some capacity. You might think about your ideal life and think, well, I have none of that. I have none of those things. I'm not any of those things, right? That's just a different world altogether. And when you look at it in one giant leap like that, you're correct. But again, your job is not to wake up tomorrow and be perfect. Open your eyes and be a, a god or goddess. Jump out of bed with a PhD and have your life all figured out, right? No, it's none of that. Your job, and this is the, the point here, is to simply connect dots from one little thing to the next. So again, you're stuck. Let's say theoretically, the, the road to something better starts with energy, having to feel good, right? Otherwise doing anything is, is, is difficult. Feeling good, feeling energetic is a baseline. So draw a dot at waking up at a reasonable time, right? Breathing in the morning air, letting the sun hit your face as it comes up in the morning. 
Boom, dot connected. You did that. You're a little bit better. Next, make a dot at groceries. What are you taking in? How are you fueling yourself? Make a few changes that uh, will have you feeling good about how you are taking care of your body. Boom, you just connected another dot. Next, dot at gym three days a week. You get the point, right? These little changes, you're starting to feel like a different person. And you can see how this upward spiral works. None of those three things was a, a monumental transition. They were small, manageable tasks. And everything of substance is a little change like this. Sometimes that's just hard to see, right? When you're frustrated, when you're looking at what you don't have, when you're comparing yourself to others, when all you see is the delta or the gap between where you are and where you want to be, all that is poison. But true change is about connecting little dots, making little roadmaps, being consistent but patient, expecting more of yourself, but also giving yourself love and grace as you make the journey. And it's from this vantage point that you truly do already have everything you need. It doesn't matter the goal, objective, or pursuit. You have exactly what you need to win. Why? Because you have everything you need to connect that next dot. Always. If only we would stop wasting time looking out, wishing and chasing things we think will solve our problems, when in reality, we walk around with the solution every single day. You know, Jim Rohn used to say, it's not where you're going, it's who you become along the way. And I think this is because as we seek to evolve and grow, we learn to create and connect those dots. We trust ourselves that, look, we don't need one giant leap. We need to step. We need little consistent action, and we're more uh, capable of that than we could ever imagine. And I'll get personal for a second. A goal of mine, I want to be one of the most impactful thinkers and orders of our generation. That invigorates me. It also is a lot, right? Even saying it feels like a lot. As the words come out of my mouth, it feels pretentious, right? Who am I to categorize myself with the best of the best? The nerve, right? But I believe it. And I believe it wholeheartedly to the point that I've bet my life on it. Why? Because I don't need to wake up tomorrow and write like Ralph Waldo Emerson or speak like MLK. I don't need to think like Nietzsche or inspire like Churchill. Nope, not tomorrow. I just need to keep creating those little dots that will bring me closer and closer. I need to find ways to connect them in real time, one day at a time, one dot at a time, and I will do that. And the best part, so can you. I'm not special, no, not in this regard. What am I? I'm a decade into connecting dots. A decade into understanding that I have everything I need to take one step and another and another. And my friend, you are capable of the same. So understand that strange dichotomy of thinking big and small simultaneously. You have to dream big, otherwise what's the point? You dream big because it forces you to ask big questions, pushes you to arrange and rearrange until you have evolved. But when we get caught up in the end result, we forget how to get there. You don't transport to greatness in your endeavor. No, you follow that roadmap, that roadmap of consistent steps. You connect the small, immediately achievable. They are the formula to outcomes that exceed expectations and bend reality. So what do you need to ultimately arrive where you most want to be? Not a miracle. You need a simple understanding. You need to acknowledge that right now, in this moment, you have everything required to build and connect the next dot. And that will always 
be enough.